Welcome to Insight. Today we're chatting with Joy Gordon, CEO of Dress for Success Worldwide, a global nonprofit that promotes the economic independence of disadvantaged women by providing professional attire, a network of support, and career development tools to help women thrive in work and life. Joy has generously agreed to share some of her experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Joy, for joining us today. Thanks for having me. So Dress for Success is very interesting. You have a very unusual concept that in part, success is based on how you feel, how you look, how you comport yourself. Talk about the impetus that resulted in an organization like this called Dress for Success Worldwide. Well, about uh, 19 years ago, actually, a young woman who was in law school, Nancy Lublin, got an inheritance from her great-grandfather of $5,000. And at the time, she really did believe with $5,000, she was going to change the world, and we've proved her right. Um, it was in the middle of the whole welfare to work movement. President Clinton was in office and there was this demand for people to get off the welfare rolls and find employment. Yet, how do you get a job if you don't have a suit? And how do you get a suit if you don't have a job? So we created the organization that really spoke to the Catch-22. And it also is a matter of how you feel for yourself. If you're going to change your life, you have to step into a new world, to step into a new mindset. And so much about mindset is, is about how you look to others, how you see yourself reflected in their eyes. Well, and you know, how you look matters, right? And so people will judge you, whether you want them to or believe they should or not. You're judged based on your appearance. And so what we wanted to do was to give women, all women, an equal footing in the workplace so that how she looked no longer mattered when she'd walk into an interview. But the suit really is a symbol for success for our women. Many of our women, more than 50% of them, have never owned a suit before. So to have a suit for the first time, that suit hangs in your closet and it really does become, for many women, that suit of armor. And so um, for Dress for Success, clothing absolutely matters. Um, but what we do more importantly than suiting her on the outside is that we suit her on the inside first. So it's about building her self-confidence and her self-worth. And we do that when she comes to Dress for Success and, and reaching out to her and talking to her about the interview, doing mock interviews, reviewing her resume, giving her the tips and tools she needs to succeed. And so we spend quite a bit of time with the women who walk through the doors at Dress for Success, not only helping them with their outer appearance, but helping them on the inside. So let's start deconstructing what you actually do. Let's say I am a woman who comes in and I have every ambition in the world I don't necessarily feel right about walking into an interview for whatever reason. It could be because of my clothes. It could be because of insecurities. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm sitting across from, from your people and I need help. What do I experience? So the very first thing that will happen at Dress for Success is that you'll be greeted at the door by somebody who knows your name. And I think the DNA of Dress for Success is how you're treated from the time. How does time. that happen? Do, am I making an appointment? You or? are. So women are referred to us by nonprofit job training programs. So we have a lot of information on you prior to you getting to us. We know who you are, what agency you're referred from. And by knowing the agency, we know a little bit about what your circumstance is. Um, we also know where you're going on your interview. And we know your suit size, your shoe size, and all the other things that matter and what position you're interviewing for. So by gre being greeted at the door by your first name certainly then creates an environment that's a safe space. Um, and I think the DNA of Dress for Success is about how we treat every woman who walks through our door, which is that we treat her with dignity and respect. And so we have her sit down, we tell her to take, t relax, because it can be very overwhelming for anyone to go to a place where you've never heard before or not know what to expect. And we try to make sure that it's beautiful, that it's an environment that's welcoming, and that we spend some time with her just getting to know her. For many of our folks who walk through our doors, they've come through some pretty horrific circumstances. Um, and so for some, they may have come out of prison, maybe they've come out of shelters, homeless shelters, domestic violence programs, recovery programs. And so being treated with respect is not something that they're accustomed to. And so it's important for us to do that for every woman who walks through our door. After we start to work with her in selecting her clothing, and she really takes control over what she feels confident in. Um, none of our dressing rooms have mirrors, so she has to step out, and we have to stand behind her and help her see herself. And for many women, it's the first time they've seen themselves in a suit. It's the first time they've seen themselves, and they're standing taller for the right. very first time. So it's very magical and transformational all at the same time. 
after we do that with her and get her suited up for her interview, as we like to call it, we sit down with her, we review her resume, we do mock interviews with her, and we prepare her. So you are also acting as consultants, and you're acting as consultants in a particular way. You understand these different environments, you understand their cultures, you understand the nuance, which for someone who is unaccustomed to those types of environments, I think of my own uh, children who are unaccustomed to walking into different environments, a, a, an environment of a publishing house or a bank or a political office, and I, you know, I get calls saying, well, what is this going to be like? And I can, of course, answer pretty blithely. But for others where there is no one to call, who There's do you no go to? There's no one to call, right. You're exactly right. For many of our women, they say, if not for Dress for Success, they would have never taken the first step. And so we're that coach, we're that cheerleader, we're their biggest fans. Um, and we're also giving them positive words of encouragement. And so we're surrounding with such positivity and our belief that they can start to believe in their self and their belief is that they can succeed. And so when she leaves out the door of Dress for Success, for many women, they walk in hunched over, they leave 10 feet taller, they're standing up straight. Um, they're believing in their ability to succeed in the interview. And if she does not, in fact, succeed in the interview, then we have programs to help her find employment. So we have a series of programs that we deliver to our women at different points in their um, professional lives. When she finds a job, we have a program for her called the Professional Women's Group that's focused on uh, job retention, professional development. Uh, we work on leadership development in our women. We talk about civic engagement for our women. So it's a very holistic approach to how we work with women who come to Dress for Success, who first need to just find employment, who now need to start to build on a career. In many respects, this is not only educational, but it is also building civic society. Absolutely. It's, it's creating independence. It's uh, showing a, a confidence that independence which is not necessarily the starting point. Independence is not only the goal, but it is a goal that you can not only achieve, but then convey to others and help others in their journey as well. Absolutely, and we know that when we can teach what it means to be free, mm -hmm. to be really economically independent, um, then those are tools that she, in most cases our women are single moms, right. that she passes on to her children. And so the only real way to pull children out of poverty is to find their mom's employment. Um, and so we have an opportunity really to right the wrong and, and move children out of being living in impoverished situations by helping their mom find employment, find self-confidence, find self-worth, and then get on a trajectory towards success. The other aspect that I find so fascinating is this is almost an anti-codependent approach, mm -hmm. right? Because this can only take you so far. You know, you can dress up but if you don't actually do the work, if you don't get to the point where, where that gets converted into, into an income, um, you can go through this a million times. Absolutely. But, but it will never be satisfying. It will never solve any problem. It doesn't put any bread on the table. No. And that's why from the very early steps addressed for success, we realized that if we were really going to define ourselves as an organization that was really going to make a difference in the world and in the lives of the women we serve, it had to be more than clothing. We really had to give women the tools they needed to succeed. And so we've created these wraparound services to help mm -hmm. every woman who walks through our door. And in 18 short years, we've helped over 800,000 women get back to work. 800,000 women. 800,000 women, which if you translate that into how many lives has changed, it's millions of lives because of the children that are impacted by their moms who now work. Let's talk about the, uh, the value chain and the logistical chain, because you have a logistical issue. You have women who are coming in, mm -hmm. and you have something as mundane as providing clothes. Um, how do you... Uh, assemble uh, those um, uh, that material, the, the clothing that you supply, and, and um, how many locations do you have? How does that all work? Well, the, the model of Dress for Success is that each Dress for Success, and we have 140 offices in 19 countries, each Dress for Success is independently run. So their own, for the most part, uh, somewhat of a franchise, if you will, right. licensing the use of the name from the headquarters at Dress for Success. So in any city around the world, um, what you'll see will mirror what it looks like to be a high-end boutique. And in that particular market, it's really the donors and the women in the community who clean out their closets and send us what we call nearly new attire. 
Um, and so they'll pull out those suits, those pants, those dresses, those um, briefcases, the handbags, and donate it to the local Dress for Success. And then, then the process happens in which we go through every donation, making sure that it is something that I myself would wear if I got And if you wouldn't job. wear it, you throw it out. If or, I don't or, wear or it, you... I um, deliver it to another not-for-profit partner that can better utilize those right. threads. Um, and so whether that's a Salvation Army or a shelter or another organization that needs clothes, not necessarily appropriate for an interview, but just right. clothing, we then recycle the clothes that are recycled to us to another entity. And so we have so many partners in so many communities. It really, that gift that that woman gives to us for our client really is that gift that keeps on giving. And in terms of your fundraising model, how does that work? So, of course, every Dress for Success is independently run, so they have their own budgets and their mm -hmm. own boards. But we certainly, as a global organization and a global brand, um, we're able to leverage global corporate and retail and partners to be part of the greater good of helping and serving women. So sometimes, for example, one of our biggest partners is the Walmart Foundation, and we've created some very strong programs with them. So we, read, we then send out the dollars that we get from the foundation and redistribute it to our affiliates so that they can do the work um, at the grassroots on the groundswell. So um, the beauty is, is that we can get global partners and redeliver dollars to our affiliates around the world so that they can do the work um, and we can source the funding. One of the interesting things about a franchise model in a nonprofit context is how the money works. Mm -hmm. If you look at a franchise model in the, in the business world, the, f the franchise right. owner pays up, mm -hmm. right? The franchisee pays up to the franchise owner who who bank and they, then they provide um, uh, certain elements of the logistics chain. And of course, it's it's profit optimized. Sure. In this particular case, you have a situation which is really optimized to be self-sustaining. So right. you provide um, expertise, you provide standards, you provide your brand, you provide recognition, you provide some marketing. Um, but, it, it, but the model is really there just to allow the entire operation, the local operation and the central operation to self-sustain. That's exactly the way we work. And so, yes, we have standards of accountability for our affiliates. We do report carding every six months against their last six months achievements. Um, and so we spend a lot of time making sure that we know where in the, the linkage of Dress for Success is there a kink in the link. So, I mean, the model of Dress for Success is that each of our Dress for Successes, now 140 of them, each pay a licensing fee, but it's a very nominal licensing fee. Um, and probably other not-for-profits set up with a structure like us will never have a licensing fee as low as ours because we're not in it to build a revenue stream from our affiliates. We're in it to have a arm's length agreement, a handshake with them as far as good faith and goodwill for protecting our brand. Right. Um, what we do for our affiliates is that we give them the structure, we give them the foundation and the support they need so that they don't recreate the wheel. They have 139 other models to look at so that they don't have to start from scratch. But we also make sure we have standards of, um, standards of accountability that we report card them every six months against their prior six months to see their growth. And it gives us an opportunity to really look at the success of an affiliate and can project where we can see some failure. And you help to fund many of your affiliates. Well, we get quite a bit of funding. And I would say that over the last five years, increasingly, we've gotten a lot more affiliate from global companies who want to support our mission of empowering women around the world. And so they'll give us the funding and we'll redistribute the funds to our affiliates. We probably, if you looked at how much money we get in and how much money we give out, we probably give out 3,000% more than we get in. Then we get in um, So it's really, you know, for our affiliates, they don't, you know, get the brand and the license to get funding from Dress for Success Worldwide. But certainly if we can support them in doing the work, um, they need the funding to survive and be sustainable. In terms of, of the populations served, is it all ages or is it primarily um, women of a, of a certain cohort? That's changed. I think when we first started out, it was certainly a much younger population we were mm -hmm. serving. I think the median age now is about 35 to 40. Um, but uh, we're seeing an increasingly larger group of older women coming through Dress for Success now. Um, ageism is real. And so for a lot of women over a certain age, they're finding it much more difficult to find their way into the workforce. 
And so I think, you know, we will continue to see an evolution of who we serve, but as the population, the boomer population starts to um, emerge um, and move out of the workforce and still need to find some level of employment, we'll probably serve that population even more than we're serving, um, you know, a different generation. Does that result in a shift in the type of services that you provide as people who are older might have different concerns or have a different experience base on the one hand, but also face different problems than people who are younger and less experienced? I think the problems can be all relative. You know, the older generation, they're kind of in the middle of the sandwich. They could be taking care of their children and taking care of their parents. Mm -hmm. So it's a different work-life balance. For the younger generation, it's taking care of their kids and themselves. And so um, it's just the struggle of, I think, being a woman in the workplace place and, and balancing, having a balancing act and juggling so many different things to make not only yourself successful, but your family successful. And if and you can make your family successful, then that ultimately um, will make your community an even better community to live in. And you, Joy, know a little bit about balancing. I, uh, you, were un you were named most powerful, one of the most powerful moms in nonprofit by Working Mother magazines. And, and so, and you have children yourself. Right. Well, I don't know if powerful makes you a great mom, <laughs> but I think <laughs> it makes me a mom in the nonprofit world. And yeah, I've learned how to juggle, but it certainly it has gotten easier as my kids have gotten older. Um, but it is a juggling act. It's not only maintaining your, your balance with your children, but with your spouse. Um, and being great on the job and great in your home and, and great to everybody who looks up to you. Um, so I try to be a model of success to, to so many different people, but it's important for me to love what I do and there is no greater joy for me than Dress for Success. Tell us about your board. How is your board constructed and, and what type of, of ex expertise and experiences do they bring to that job that doesn't pay. Absolutely. I have the hardest working non-paid group of leaders uh, surrounding me. They're that C-suite executive, um, you know, from hospitality, from apparel, uh, finance, business, retirees. Um, it's just a, a real eclectic group of uh, corporate leaders. And that diversity of experience is very important given Absolutely. the range of services that you provide. And gender is also critical. So even though it's an organization which is really about empowering women, it's important that I have really strong, smart men who sit on the board of Dress for Success and helping direct and guide me and giving me the advice that I need to lead this organization. So um, it's a great group of leaders that um, have a maximum term on our board of six years, but they always look to find the next person to replace them because they so believe in the mission of Dress for Success. What's next for the organization? Are you going to continue to, uh, to scale? Are you going to evolve your services over the next years? Expand your footprint? Well, we're knee deep in the middle of our strategic plan right now. So those are all the questions that are on the table. Um, but I definitely have seen a significant increase in the desire to bring Dress for Success to countries, um, other countries. So I think we'll see more of a global um, imprint um, happening over the next three to five years as opposed to domestically. We're probably everywhere we need to be in all the big cities and all the metropolitan cities that we need to be in America. So we're going to look at what this brand, what this mission looks like outside of America in countries that we never thought we could get into. I think it's so interesting to see the world change and shift it, uh, as, as it has. It is so much more possible to take models that are developed in one place and move them to a city that is a that are continents away in a completely different environment yet major cities have so much in common rural areas have so much in common one with the other and now with the kind of communication that can be afforded that type of expertise can really be transformed uh, transferred absolutely i think our biggest our greatest strength is that this brand dress for success not only the name which is memorable right um, but it's so searchable on the internet. And so sometimes people aren't even looking for the organization. They're just looking for tips on how to dress for success. And in, the, in doing so, they find our organization and realize we're not in the city and that they're located. And wouldn't it be great if they put together a team of people to bring dress for success? And you're not just about, about dress. Exactly. And, and success has many definitions. Absolutely. And, and the wraparound uh, services that you provide are so valuable. So to take a look at one concept that is targeted uh, for women and yet provides so many different advantages 
if you take that same concept and you move it to New York or Nairobi, to Frankfurt, Germany, or Beijing, China, you still have the same issues the that same are core. encountered. Absolutely. The same core and the same types of approaches, perhaps with a different accent. I think over the next three to five years, you'll see Dress for Success um, going places and going strong. Um, that's our tagline, and that's exactly who we are as an organization. Well, Joy Gordon, thank you so much for sharing the experience of Dress for Success with us. Thank you so much for sharing your insights with us, and thank you for transforming the lives of so many women. Thank you.